Thank you. Lesson 12. Prana. We're going to prepare for pranayama, which in many cases is practiced as breath control, breathing exercises. But in some places, places of true initiation, pranayama is taught not as breath control, but as energy control. I will prove that the approach with energy control is correct. While breathing exercises are good for the lungs and the level of oxygen in the blood, the way that the pranayama exercises are described in chapter 2, it's impossible to do them as breath control, simply because you will die. So we will get to that. Today, we will first just talk about prana as energy. The whole Eastern philosophy is based on the premise that everything is energy. And you find this principle not only in yoga, but also in traditional medicine. Prana is like what Korean people call qi energy. Chinese people call it qi energy. So it's not just energy, it's vital energy. What is energy? Energy consists out of two polarities, two opposites, that are constantly fluctuating. Even energy that comes from the socket in the wall, AC, DC, it's two polarities. One polarity wouldn't make your machines work. You need those two polarities. Everything in the universe consists out of energy. It takes on a different quality depending on the particular mix of energy that it consists of. You have soft material, you have hard material. You have liquid, you have gases, you have solid materials, etc. But in essence, it all exists out of those two polarities of energy. The human being also exists out of those, those two polarities, but the difficulty that we have with energy, and therefore energy control, is that it is something that we cannot see, smell, feel, touch, hear. And so we are doubting Thomas's when it comes to subtle energy. So we will very systematically prepare you for pranayama by first of all discussing prana and starting from next week we will do some exercises that are designed to prepare you for the first pranayama. In China they call these two opposing polarities yin and yang. We discussed that in the very first class. In Sanskrit, it's called Shiva and Shakti. Now, most yoga teachers will tell you that Shiva is the masculine polarity in this mix, 
and Shakti is the feminine polarity in this mix. Then when you tell them that actually Shiva is feminine and Shakti is masculine, they will say, no, that is not correct. Shiva is a male god. He is the lord of the dance. So that energy is masculine. And Shakti is female god, a goddess. So that energy is feminine. And many books will actually say the same. Written by people who are not initiated into the secrets of yoga. In fact, if only they had studied this book, which is the foundation of yoga, the Bible of yoga, they would have known. In lesson one, I tried to explain with the model of yin and yang. There is the light side and the dark side. The dark side has a spot that has the color of the light side, and the light side has a spot that has the color of the dark side. That is Shiva and Shakti being carrying the other's characteristic. Remember this? Now, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is very clear about it in certain sutras in chapter 3. Which is about uh, the mudras, which are energy control exercises higher than pranayama. Chapter 3, Sutra 106. The great goddess Kundalini sleeps closing with her mouth the entrance of, to the way by which the seat of Brahman, where there is no pain, is to be reached. The great goddess Kundalini is Shakti. Sutra 107 says, the Kundalini Shakti, who sleeps above the Kanda, which is the tail, below the tailbone, gives liberation to yogins and bondage to the ignorant. He who knows yoga, he who knows her, knows yoga. Kundalini Shakti, Shakti is a feminine goddess, it's a goddess, feminine god. But it's the energy that we also know as Kundalini, which Symbolically, is described as a snake sleeping at the bottom of the spine. Shiva energy flows from the top to the bottom. Shakti energy rises from the bottom to the top. So if you say that Shiva energy is masculine, then this text is contradicting itself then instead of saying Kundalini Shakti, they should have said Kundalini Shiva. Not only that. Sutra 108, the Kundalini is described as being coiled like a serpent. He who causes that Shakti to move, again Shakti, not Shiva, from the Muladhara upwards, becomes free without a doubt. Yoga teachers who are properly initiated know that Shakti, although a male god, represents feminine energy and Shiva, although a goddess, represents masculine energy. Shiva, although a god, represents... Shiva is male, yeah, okay. represents mas uh, feminine energy. 
Did I turn you, it around? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my mind is twisted. <laughs> Even a simple thing is complicated. Okay, again, <laughs> correctly. Shiva is a male god, the lord of dance, represents feminine energy. Shakti, a goddess, a feminine god, represents masculine energy. On their own, they are not powerful. They are powerful when they are harmonious with each other. When there is a balance between the two, then a third channel opens up that is called Shushumna Nadi. So I will draw this on the board, otherwise it becomes very difficult to follow. The reason also why this horse does not have physical anatomy is because not one serious yoga book has, contains physical anatomy. In contrast with most modern yoga courses where physical anatomy is 70% of the curriculum. Why does yoga not have physical anatomy with all these exercises, stretches and what have you? Why? Because everything is energy. And the anatomy in yoga we call subtle anatomy. It's not about muscles, bones and uh, joints, it's about energy circulation, subtle anatomy. So the yoga body consists out of not skin, bone and muscle tissue, it exists out of chakras, seven to be precise. Munadara, Svadhisthana, Manipura, Anahata, Vishuddhi, Ashna. Ashna is usually drawn as a diamond, and then you have above the head, it's the only one outside, the body, the physical body. You have Sahasrara chakra, the crown chakra. It's usually drawn. You can see actually. There, there's also one in your handout. The editor uh, put the uh, illustration there. On the front of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, there is a drawing from Ajita. So you can see that um, Ashna Chakra, which is the mental body, is a diamond, and the Crown Chakra is a flame, which the flame represents the light, literally the light. People whose consciousness opens up become enlightened, which is the opposite of darkness. Darkness is ignorance, light is wisdom. Literally, light. Shiva energy enters through the top. This is very interesting. All of you hear Nada now, right? Nada accompanies the inflow of Shiva energy. This explains when you are very tired or when you are sick and also when you're drunk. Nada is very loud. Why? Because when you're tired or sick, Nada rushes in in large amounts to make you recover because na uh, 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 Shiva energy is responsible for recovery. So Shiva energy flows in from the top, it winds around chakras. This is all symbolical. The reality is there are 72,000 energy channels, not just one or two. This, this is symbolic, but symbolism is important here. Shiva energy enters through the top, winds down the chakras, and it exits through the bottom. The gate at the top is called Tandra Bindu.
Chandra means moon. The Indian rocket program, the rockets they build are called Chandra 1, Chandra 2, Chandra is the moon. Chandra is the moon. That is the moon gate. There was this yogi. Did I mention Pralajani? He claimed to feed himself through a hole in the pallet. He didn't eat, he didn't drink all his life. Since he, he was 11 years old or so. That is this. That is the milk and honey from the Holy Scriptures. The mana that comes from heaven. That is Shiva energy. Shiva is the feeding principle. Shakti energy goes the other way. It enters through the bottom, which is called no surprise, Surya Bindu. The sun gate. Shakti enters through the sun gate and rises up, winding counterwise around the chakras. And it leaves, it exits through Chandra Bindu. Now this is a natural law. Shiva can never go from the bottom up. And Shakti can never go from the top down. Shakti enters at the bottom, rises up, Shiva goes from the top to the bottom. The channels are called Pingala for the channel through which Shakti energy streams Ida for the channel through which Shiva energy streams. You don't have to memorize this as long as you understand the principle. Maybe I showed you this in the first class already, but just to be sure. If you draw a snake head on the left and the right side, you see a symbol that you see all around the world. Where do you see that? On ambulances and hospitals. And your general physician's office at the front door has a placate with this symbol. So this foundation the energy foundation of the human being was known in ancient cultures. For modern day people, it is merely a decoration. But it is reflecting the blueprint of your energy household. It is symbolism. As I said, there are not only two channels in the human being, but 72,000. But the principle of Shakti rising up, Shiva descending, is correct. That is what also what you will do when you do pranayama. You take control of the flow of these of these energies. The condition of the distracted, scattered human being is like this. One moment Shiva energy dominates. The other moment, Shakti energy dominates, totally depending on the current circumstances. So our function is always determined by circumstances. There are circumstances in nature, day and night. At night, Shiva energy naturally dominates to make you rest and recover. For another day, in the morning, Shakti energy starts to dominate and you start to become active. 
That is a cycle in nature, 24 hour cycle of day and night. You see early in the morning, the sun comes up, the flowers open up, the birds come out of their nest and start looking for food, and human beings, like it or not, your eyes will open, even if you don't want to, your eyes will open, you will awaken, and you will start to become active, naturally. It's a cycle of nature. The unconditioned human being is never in peace. But we like peace, sattva, we call that condition sattva. So we find superficial ways to enjoy sattva. Often, we can indeed enjoy sattva, but we have to pay a price. Later, the fluctuation between Shiva and Shakti, the disturbance, becomes even bigger. Ways to experience sattva is in food. The reason why you spend an unreasonable amount of money on a very delicious dish is because it gives you a moment of heaven. The purpose of cuisine is to bring you to heaven. That is why the royal court of China, the royal court of France and India and many other around the world, but I mentioned the most famous ones, the most known cuisines, they had hundreds of chefs working for them, for the royal family, to invent new dishes to allow the emperor to go to heaven through food. It is the only reason. You can just eat anything, but no, if you can afford it, you take something that elevates your spirit, literally. You can do that by buying a German car, three times as expensive as a Korean car. But sitting in that car, hearing the purr of the engine, the logic of all the, the switches and, and gauges, and, and it is the, the, the experience of the perfection. It leads to sattva. Very expensive in this case. People who work very hard, they have a tendency to at least twice a year go on a vacation. Where do you most of the times go? You go to a place without knowing, you do this subconsciously, you go to a place where you can be in heaven. A paradise. You go to Bali, you go to Phuket, you go to any place where you can just totally forget about your daily life, your work, your worries, and just, just enjoy the beach and the, the, the nice food, of course, the cocktails and what have you, the sun, the sea, the blue skies, just for a moment you can be God in paradise, costing a lot of money. Yoga, you have to work for, but yoga can offer you this for free. All you need is a mat and a cushion. Or actually, instead of a mat, it's better to use a woolen blanket. The mat, mats are an invention of uh, the past uh, uh, decades. What is it all about? It's about harmony. And why is this harmony so important? Harmony leads to light, destroys the darkness, leads to light. Why? A human being naturally, or no, energy naturally has a tendency to condense and manifest towards the bottom. If you ask what is a human being, 
in the first place, a human being is pure consciousness, pure energy. The physical body, that is the bottom of the manifestation of energy. Your physical body is, is a house in which the spirit, your essence, the spirit lives temporarily. Because energy has a natural tendency to gravitate towards the bottom, our energy is below the diaphragm. And what do we find below the diaphragm? Our most essential animal instincts. Lower emotions and desires. Instinctive sexuality. Fear. Doubt. Worry. All find their origin below the diaphragm. But also, ego and ambition. So if energy is below the diaphragm, emotions, desires, fear, sexuality dominate our lives and lead to a very unstable, restless existence. Now something very interesting happens when sattva occurs between harmony between Shiva and Shakti energy. This is the reason why spiritual places are very peaceful and quiet. This is the reason why Temples are far away from the hustle and bustle from of daily life. Monasteries. What happens? In the calm, in the harmony, a third channel opens up. And you can see, you can see in the illustration very clearly, and if you look at ambulances and hospitals at the symbol, that third channel is always present. Ancient people, cultures knew this. This channel only comes into existence when there is harmony, sattva. And that is only possible if you create the circumstances that allow sattva. As long as you stay restless, distracted by lower emotions and desires, sattva will never occur. So the, the cultivation of the higher characteristics of the human being, love, compassion, empathy, wisdom, intuition, vision, these characteristics do not manifest. Because these are all characteristics in the higher chakras. In essence, this is this is the essence of yoga. Once you understand this, you realize it's not important when you can do a hundred and eighty degree split or whether you can put your foot behind your neck or any kind of principles. If you continue practicing, you will be able to do that without much effort. But it's not the goal. It's not what you pursue. Just go through your daily practice with this in mind and someday you will find yourself capable of doing the pretzel poses. But without harming yourself, without hurting yourself, without tearing muscles and, and muscle pain and what have you, or frustration for that matter, for not being perfect.
the first important transformation of the yogi is the breaching the breaching of the diaphragm to open the heart and this happens quite soon many yoga teachers talk about this as being something very mysterious and it will take many many years of practice no you will already notice in the very beginning of your yoga practice that is actually starting to take place of course it's not a full opening of the heart which sometimes takes decades but the heart becomes activated how do you know you become more sensitive you become more emotional you become aware consciously aware of things you never considered important before about family members about the destruction of the environment on a global scale about about famine taking place far from your bed and never being of any importance before now starts to bother you you start to care And that heart will only become bigger. We will talk about the heart chakra in detail, of course. Of course, that energy continues to rise. The throat chakra is the location of uh, higher emotions, creativity, expression in all its forms, physical, verbal, but also uh, mental and spiritual. Ajna Chakra is one of the big goals because there the intellect is located. And the highest goal is of course the opening up of the Crown Chakra because intellect in itself is worthless without vision, intuition, insight. Try to picture this. Ancient people, without the benefit of 20 years of compulsory education as we all have been subjected to, they had no intellect. And the reason why ancient books are all written in symbolical language is because that's the way people functioned mentally. They didn't have the power of rational thought as we have. It is the reason why we don't understand the ancient books. Because we have a tendency to take, the li to take literal the symbolical language. And it leads to, it can lead to extremism, radicalism. But it can also lead to misunderstanding of very special exercises like pranayama and the mudras. We take that literally and they become, in fact, harmful. So ancient people did not have intellect, but that has a big benefit. Because that left room for the intuition to be very strong. So ancient people, we can say, or it is actually written and said people were closer to God. What does that mean? They were much more connected with the world of spirits, with energy, with nature, intuitively, naturally. But they were not able to rationalize it. Which explains why Still in Korea, all the generations who did not have the benefit of this development of education, they're very superstitious. You understand what superstition is? Superstition is your connection with the supernatural, with subtle energy, with the world of spirits. 
but not understanding it rationally, then fear occurs. That is superstition. Modern people with 20 years of compulsory education, they laugh at superstition. But for older generations, that is very real. This explains why. But with those 20 years of compulsory education, we have killed that connection with the world of spirit and the supernatural. We have to find a balance between the two. Intellect without intuition leads to theorizing without understanding. Intuition without intellect leads to superstition, fear of the unknown. If they are supporting each other, what do you get? You get genius. Genius is being able to deeply understand the essence of matter. So you will find, if you study people of great genius like Einstein, like the Italian inventors, uh, 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 what's there, there are two of them, Galileo and, and, and yeah, that's another one. And da Vinci. Da Vinci. Tesla. Tesla. If you, <laughs> yeah, if, if you study, if you look at the background of these people, they were naturally very spiritual. They were eccentric, which indicates they were functioning in the crown chakra. That combined with their field of expertise led to incredible or even revolutionary inventions. But there are many people, especially with all the education that we have, there are many people who have degrees in the same fields as those people. And they never come up with revolutionary inventions. Why? Because they stay at the level of intellect. There is no contemplation, there is no new insight, there is no new... Look at Einstein, this guy came up with theories that still scientists are trying to understand and trying to explain. His insights were so deep. Where do these insights come from? From deep contemplation. Your ability to connect the dots. You will all become natural scientists, whatever it is that you are interested in. Probably most of you will develop a very deep insight simply in life in general. Starting with yourself and then extending, expanding to the outside world. That's why I always follow the news. I need to know what's happening, what's going on. It helps me to understand mankind. Uh, Ron. Yes, know me. So, I'm African. Mm -hmm. Africans in general are very, okay, let me say where I come from, they're very superstitious. Yes. But my understanding with the most African superstitious they're a metaphor. For example, we say, don't sleep at night. But if you understand why, it's because you might sleep away something valuable. Or we say, oh, the woman shouldn't eat from the pot. You will develop a deep voice. But the reason why is because it just doesn't look good on a woman to be eating from a pot. Yes, Says who? <laughs> well, that's tradition. No. Uh, then another one, for example, would say, don't jump a child, don't not grow. But the reason is you might, actually don't jump anybody, like when I'm sitting like this, don't jump, uh, or don't walk over me like this, you need to walk the other way. Yeah. 
and then they say you won't grow. But the reason is you might trip and fall. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. to me, they are more of a, like a field of speech. They are metaphor. They are meaning behind them. Yeah. 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 If you if you uh, if you become a uh, when I came to Korea. I was confronted with a very traditional way of Korean life, and it's also it's based on those kind of things. But it's more about respect, respect to the to the older or to the the, the master of the of the Hakuto gym, or it's very superficial in a way. When you go drinking with Koreans, and they they will turn away and drink, it's almost like as if they drink in secret. Uh, you, you don't you don't smoke in the presence of a, of a superior. Um, all these kind of things, you know, but uh, I saw that as an outsider and I I, I, I felt my Hapkido teacher was very lonely because of that. Because all his subordinates obeyed all those rules, so they had to abandon him to have a smoke behind the building or something. Um, but you know, the more educated people become, the more they get rid of those kind of um, superficial rules and superstitions. I've been here 23 years, and in Korea it's very rapidly. The younger generations are totally different. Totally different. Good. Where were we? <laughs> I think I've covered. Insight plus field of expertise. What? what? We were talking about genius. Yeah, yeah, so, genius. Well, I just have one question about the types of energy because prana yep. also loops around the chakras. Are she even checking types of prana or is prana something different? Prana is vital energy, which consists out of Shiva and Shakti. Oh. And if that is harmonious, it leads to a phenomenon. Thanks for the question, bringing it back to where we should be. Because <laughs> this is important. I think I have a follow-up question as well. <laughs> That's good. Keep it in mind. When there is sattva, we call it sattva, that's the harmony between Shiva and Shakti, the coiled up snake which is latent energy, the snake is just symbolism, but the snake is sleeping at the bottom, through conditioning, in our case yoga practice, that snake rises up, pierces the chakras, and feeds the higher characteristics in the human being. Kundalini Shakti. So, there are many dogmas and mysteries in yoga and one of those is kundalini it all sounds very mysterious but first of all it's subtle while when you hear teachers talk about it it seems like something explosive and spectacular which is not the reality the reality is it's a, it's a gradual development and it is subtle it does lead to amazing uh, manifestation, of course, with the opening up of the heart and consciousness, but it is a slow process, a gradual process. Wait, otherwise I lose my thread. Wait, keep it in mind. <laughs> so there are many mysteries surrounding Kundalini. But it is, it is a very natural phenomenon. What is mysterious about it is you need to create the circumstances that allows that phenomenon to occur. But there are places where you can join a Kundalini yoga class. Have you done a Kundalini yoga class? I had in the past a student who said, I practice Kundalini yoga for 13 years. You know what? I'm going to spoil the fun for you. All yoga is Kundalini yoga. <laughs> if it is done correctly. 
Why? Because if you do yoga correctly, sattva occurs and this phenomenon takes place. So all yoga, if it is done correctly, which means that it leads to sattva, leads to the kundalini phenomenon. In the same way that bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of serving, is not standing on its own. Because the moment your heart starts opening up, you naturally want to serve, you want to care. What do yoga teachers do? They say, ah, welcome to my bhakti yoga class. Here you have a bucket and a mop, you can clean the floor. Do some bhakti. Or they call it seva or karma yoga or... Yeah, there are many ways to, but, is it, but it is in fact, it's just blatant abuse. <laughs> when you're done with the floor, you get another bucket to clean the windows. <laughs> I'm just kidding a little bit. But it's a natural occurrence. And um, the, the basically the, that, that applies to yoga is yoga. That's in the beginning of the course or during the uh, introduction workshop. I asked, how many yogas are there? How many? One, only one. And it incorporates everything, if it is done correctly. And it's not that difficult, really. Your other question? Oh, just that I see, sometimes seen like this diagram, but the, the two channels join at the top, like it kind of goes and then loops around the top and then comes back down, so it's a little bit different. Like, I'm, I'm not so accurate about it, I'm not a specialist. In the end, uh, the symbol, symbolism was, uh, did you understand the principle of the symbol? I have a question about the Kundalini after yeah. it's rising up. Yeah. Uh, it's very strong. Yeah. Uh, it's not like the Kundalini Is it? Uh, I was wondering, because I never did it. It's not. Yeah, but you said all yoga is the same, so I thought, 
before you answered it, I thought the Kundalini school found a more efficient or quicker method or process, but you said all yoga is yoga. In Israel, you have a sect of Kundalini yogis, and they sit they sit in a, in a lotus pose, and they with their knees they push themselves off the ground, and then they land very hard on their tailbone, which is dangerous. <laughs> I heard it's kind of painful too. It's painful and it's dangerous. Um, so just practice yoga. If you practice yoga the normal way, there are no there are no s sparkles and and uh, explosions and and what have you, but Although the process is very subtle, the transformation that takes place is incredible. It truly is a transformation from darkness to light. It truly is an information from a transformation from ignorance to to knowledge, to wisdom, to vision. The thing with the transformation is it takes place over time and everybody who has a child knows that you don't see your child growing really because you see your child every day but your uncle or aunt that comes from far away and visits only once a year sees you after one year and says wow you grew so much well it's the same for you as a yogi you transform, you change very slowly, and actually pretty fast, in other people's eyes. Because after a year, you meet people you haven't seen since you started practicing yoga, and they say, hmm, there's something different about you. You change, but I, I don't know exactly what. I can't put my finger on it, but you're actually you're quite different. That is the transformation. You didn't know this because you are with yourself every day and those changes are so gradual, incremental but gradual. If you look back, maybe then you can see a difference. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. When you compare Kundalini like the higher, and then you say that if we stop practicing, the plane gets smaller, Yes. And then, and then, like. No, there, there is there is a danger here. Yeah. It's a it's a mistake that many spiritual people make. They practice for twenty years. They put a, a, on their desk or on their front door. They put a, a placard that says "I'm a master," and they stop practicing. But the transformation that occurs, the opening up of consciousness, mm -hmm. does not reverse when your energy doesn't fuel a higher levels anymore and that is where it goes wrong with the abuse and the sects and the, the, the manipulation indoctrination that that you see in many spiritual circles is people who have done the work they have gone to higher levels of consciousness that consciousness remains open it doesn't close but their energy drops to the lower emotions and desires, and that's where the power games begin, and the control, and the, and the abuse and indoctrination. Mm. Okay. They make the mistake thinking that, that they have done the work, and now they don't have to practice anymore. Mm -hmm. And they just want to sit on their laurels, and uh, so that's not correct. Yes? So it does happen suddenly, sometimes, and it, le it leads to very serious repercussions. It happens sometimes when people get treated with healing techniques. Like a Reiki or healing with, with energy happens in those cases sometimes. It happens sometimes, it happens sometimes with people who go to those retreats 
where they meditate for 10 hours a day, 10 days in a row. Meditation is good, but if you're a total beginner and you never meditated, that is very intense. And it is so intense that people get psychological problems because of that. Yes. I've had several students come to Magic Pond after being messed up by such kind of uh, retreat and then basically grounding themselves again by systematically going through the whole process and understanding based on the, on the lectures what happened and why and what it means. Yes, so that is, that is, um, and, and the people that do those, this, uh, uh, they call it, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, hopping or something? Uh, the, the, I know of a sect in Israel, but uh, there are more. Um, that can also lead to a violent uh, Kundalini awakening. It's dangerous. It is because of this that uh, people who know of, have heard about Kundalini often, uh, most of what people know about Kundalini is that it could be dangerous, but they don't know why. And that, that is when Kundalini is forcibly awakened, often accidentally, by shock. But if it is done properly, just going through your daily practice, it happens very gradually, you barely notice. It's a process that takes place step by step, and there is no danger at all with Kundalini. So only in exceptional, in extreme cases. So there is also no need to be afraid of it. It's actually, Kundalini is just a really a good thing. And Kundalini, you know, it's just a name. Yeah. I... But what is really important is the phenomenon that it tries to describe in symbolical language. So, uh, with this, like, uh, you know, physical exercise, like, that's how we are uh, going to, like, how we can say Kundalini, okay? So, it is, for example, it's kind of like a goal. So, what is the next after how we can, after Kundalini rise up, then what should we do? Manifest your Dharma. Good question. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Eventually, yoga will lead to the manifestation of your true destiny, which is Dharma. Dharma is another word that is surrounded by a lot of mystery. Everyone who went to a temple or speaks with Buddhist monks, they know about Dharma. You have those weekly meetings, it's called Dharma talk. But the literal meaning of Dharma is essence. Essence of what? You. Strange. I know who I am. So what are you talking about finding my essence, my Dharma? No, the thing is, since you were born, you're being indoctrinated and polluted with outside impressions and those outside impressions pile up to such an extent that you have no connection anymore with your essence you lose that already before you become conscious as a child because of culture because of your mom and dad's upbringing the things that they tell you are good and bad because of education education is a big burden in, in fact it has good things and bad things um, so practicing yoga <laughs> what is the purpose of all this eventually is to come back to the self the real self and manifest that in life that's karma yoga but karma yoga is not a class where you can go they exist <laughs> same as with, with kundalini yoga it's not just a class where you can go. Oh, let's practice karma yoga today. Karma yoga is the highest stage of your growth process. There you have burned all the karma from the past, which is a process of becoming conscious 
of your past, of yourself, and then becoming aware of your path towards the future. The real karma yogi is the person able to avoid new distractions and stay on the path related to their dharma, their, their essence, their hearts or their soul content. I described that a little bit with other words in the handout. What happens with people who practice yoga and, and open up consciousness at the heart and start connecting, make soul connection? Everything that you know so far, everything that you learned so far, everything, every knowledge that you have acquired so far, you will put that under a loop. You will put that under a magnifier. You will investigate and reinvestigate everything. And you will toss out everything that feels superficial and not belonging to you. And what remains is what, what truly is the content of your heart, your, your, your soul consciousness, your, your true essence. And you will gradually more and more move in that direction, follow up on that essence, what you have discovered. What I described in the handout is that what happens with you is you change. And people who know you, friends from the past, family members, they will scratch their head and say, what, what the hell is going on with you? You always liked this, but now you don't, and now you like something else. Why? Why did you change? Why did you change your mind? And sometimes people become a little bit irritated or upset because you become you become you become more determined because not rationally but deep in your heart you know you start knowing what is important in life where you want to go, what you want to do. And that is often against the grain of what other people expected from you. And there, conflict will occur. But that's okay. You can move to Korea. <laughs> or, in this case, you can reverse. You can move to the Netherlands. <laughs> it's the road not taken. I have to say it again. That's the heart opening up. Yeah. So is it like happening? Like, I will check like most of it for that. I couldn't really narrate any the uh, vegetarian. So vegetarianism is a very natural development in people who open their hearts simply because you start seeing the animal behind the piece of meat. Yeah. And you and you know every animal, not only cats and dogs. All animals connect with human beings. Yeah. Actually, like, do you remember I asked you one question that, like, even the vegetables are, they have, like, they are like, alive, right? So, yes. Uh, but, like, uh, I found, like, something uh, uh, in the, like, YouTube. And some researchers, you know, they uh, check the signal of the vegetable in trees. Like, some uh, like researchers found that, like, even when you are thinking about eating some like, potatoes or some like, vegetables, that wish 
do you know? Yeah, so, uh, if, if you realize yeah, that, that yeah, the plants yeah, also yeah. are alive, you cannot cut them and eat them also. No, no, they, How far do you go? No, no, they conclude that like in, before eating, if you appreciate that food, then it is right. Heavy. Right. The ancient people without rational thought had a much better idea of the value of these things that we now take for granted. We just get it in the supermarket wrapped in a piece of plastic and we have no idea of the life that's in it and the energy behind it and the process where it comes from. Mm. Actually that research is quite for the for the concept of mind living the mind lived energy. Our mind is the the, the commander of everything. Mm. Okay, it sounds mind like home to me. My lips and energy like in meditation. When we lift the energy by our mind. So this um explain to his the question or he said about the, the, the something before eating when you think about the food right? Yes. So it you, you will take a lot of benefit from the 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 fruit or the vegetable, right? Yes. Did you say that? Yes. So it it more confirm about the mind, mind leads the energy, and you get the most benefit of that. I think the researcher wants to confirm the importance of our mind. Yes. More than physical, more than eating, action, it, it digestive or something. Okay, it's, it, it's just a, it's, it's, it's an exercise in consciousness, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Eating consciously. But you know, know that there's there's research that shows that plants, when they are being truly cared for, they grow better. Even even there are experiments where they play Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, mm -hmm. classical music. You probably all heard about these experiments, and the plants really thrive as a result of that. They are living beings, and. You can come to my house. My plants, they are very lush. They are very... Um, I, apparently, I don't only connect with animals, dogs. That's why they are doing so well. But the plants too. If you are sattvic, what is around you becomes sattvic. <coughs> it's a holy duty, in fact, to make this world a better place. Once you are transforming, it will radiate. It's not only, it's not a selfish pursuit, it's really spreading, it really does. That's why I called our yoga magic point. Mm. <laughs> it's truly magic. Yeah. Yes. You understand magic? Turning lead into gold? I probably said this already. And turning lead, you know, scientists who have no intuition, only degrees in science, they have and still try to turn lead into gold, and they never succeed. Why? It's symbolism. This is turning lead into gold. Darkness into light. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's all symbolism for this process where the human being transforms into a higher being. And that is why religion is about God and divinity and what have you, and it has all become so superficial and nobody understands it anymore. But that's this. It is kind of special or divine or holy to have this process taking place, isn't it? But nothing mysterious about it. Everybody has Kundalini sleeping at the bottom of the spine and everybody, if doing the right thing, can have that energy rising up and, and 
manifesting characteristics in you that that did you always had but never manifested. And it is my firm belief that the original purpose of our current, our modern education system was designed to come to this process. But they then overshot the goal with all the concentration, the focus being on the learning process and not anymore on going beyond that to the ground chakra. Ancient people, they were lacking rationality, but had a huge intuition. We, the modern people, have a huge intellect, but are lacking intuition. Of course, there are many people who have. That is where common sense comes from. And you see there is a division of about 50-50. You can see that in politics. It's, it's the battle between dark and light. It's a battle between ignorance and wisdom. You see that in Holland. You see that in America, you see that everywhere. It's about half-half. When you realize that, you realize it's a little bit scary. Because if the dark half gets the overhand, you have chaos, war. Oh, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> well, kind of a little bit. Fortunately, there is a lot of light that tries to avoid it. Other questions? Yes. So like, so I have a question about now ahimsa and non-violence and then <laughs> and then vegetarianism because your eleven so class like, is too late. <laughs> so like in his example of how the research concludes that when we give our gratitude to that and we appreciate it, then it's okay. Then I'm wondering, can we extend this conclusion to animal or any anything that we consume? If we extend our gratitude to it before, then maybe that, it's okay. Yeah, but you know, there is no one answer to that because everybody will everybody will have their own idea or opinion about that. But ancient people did, in fact, treat animals like that. They treated them with a lot of respect. And they had a ritual before they would yeah. kill them for food. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is out of respect, out of the connection basically with that animal that you unfortunately you have to sacrifice so, so, to survive. So then it seems But like these are philosophical questions that each individual will have to answer for themselves. Mm -hmm. How far do you go? There are there are people who eat only shrimp and and, and uh, shrimp and uh, uh, shellfish because they are they are very low on the ladder of, of uh, evolution. They're not sentient. So while a cow and a pig and a goat you can connect with, there's no such connection with uh, with uh, shrimp. And I I dare to uh, I dare to. Uh, argue otherwise, but people think, well, they're lower on, on the ladder of evolution, so, you know, it's kind of a compromise. We can eat those beings. Mm -hmm. You know, as a child, I befriended, uh, I befriended a fly. <laughs> there was a fly in my bedroom, and uh, I was in a me melancholic uh, 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 condition, and I brought a little bit of sugar, and I started talking to this fly and fe I started feeding it sugar. And it, every time it would come, when I would call it, you could say that is a coincidence or you know you bribed it with sugar. But flies are on a lower level maybe, but they function in the same way. If they feel that you are not a threat, they dare to come close. If they feel you're a threat, they will stay away from you. It's the same as, as the, the YouTube videos where people befriend a bear or an alligator or, or a, a tiger. That's possible if you fulfill that animal's lowest instinct of fear. They don't kill you because they like to kill. They kill out of fear or because they're hungry. 
if you fulfill their basic needs, they become tame. I wouldn't advise you to try, <laughs> but but that that is that is my understanding of this is how I how I dealt with with Pada and Papi. Routine, stability, love, good food, and repeat. And don't expect anything. Don't expect them to behave or to uh, because they takes time. Normal people they become impatient. They become, or they even feel uh, insulted when uh, when uh, their pet doesn't obey. Or well, I just just let them be. I understand from the perspective of the chakras how it works. So, from next week we will discuss that also chakras. Then about Kundalini, uh, so about Kundalini. That person that I met that said I practice yoga for 13 years, Kundalini yoga, talked to me in this way. Oh yeah, man, cool. I practice Kundalini yoga for so many years, man. 13 years. There are yogis. Questionable whether they are real yogis. But they think because yoga is relaxing, they think that if they speak like as if they are drugged, they will impress you as a, as a proof of the fact that they are experienced long-term yogis, which shows that they don't understand yoga. Why am I talking about this? Because of Kundalini. Kundalini is that fire, is vital energy. Instead of slanted eyes and being half drugged and speaking with a drug voice, Deliberately, yoga does the opposite with the practitioner. You become more vital, you become more energetic. So your eyes will be bigger and brighter, and you speak with enthusiasm and passion. So it's the opposite of, you know, relaxation is very misunderstood. Normal relaxation, as we think about relaxation, is always temporary. The relaxation that yoga aims for is permanent. It's a condition. And that condition only exists as long as there is a large amount of good quality energy. So it is a very different relaxation than the relaxation of smoking some marijuana or taking a chemical drug that oppresses. On the contrary, it is your increasing health that makes you feel more relaxed. And that is a permanent condition, not something that fluctuates. So overall, you will become more and more comfortable and relaxed as a re result of your changing condition. You will notice also, as yoga practitioners, in the beginning stages of your development, every time you practice, you feel so great. And then it fades away again. And it comes back the next time when you practice. But if you keep practicing throughout the years, it becomes a permanent condition. And one day you ask yourself, why, why on earth am I practicing yoga still? I don't feel the difference anymore. This is a trap in which you fall if you don't understand what happened. You have become so used to that permanent condition of feeling good that your yoga session doesn't make a big difference anymore. In the beginning, you are unconditioned. You practice, sattva occurs, and you say, wow, this is so nice. I'm going to practice again tomorrow. Between now and tomorrow, slowly your nice sattvic condition fades away, and it comes back again tomorrow after your practice, during your practice. The 
continue to practice that condition becomes more and more permanent and then you say well I don't feel a difference anymore why should I continue to practice beware when this happens do not give up on your practice see it as a confirmation rather than a discouragement it shows that the transformation has taken place and is to some extent even completed. But you give up on your practice, energy starts to condense towards the bottom again, lower emotions and desires take over again, and it does, it can lead to evil, it can lead to, it can lead to bad things. It is the reason, we will start with the Hatha Yoga Pratipika after the chakras, but we, we will do some with the Kriya exercises starting from next week. Good actually. You have to, if you want to follow with reading, uh, bring a, bring a, print out chapter one only. No, chapter two. We will start reading from chapter two next week. Um, I lost the thread again. <laughs> Evil things can happen, things. Then? fall into the trap, and then beware, don't practice, beware to not stop practicing because something can happen when the energy starts falling again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I made the connection again. <laughs> There are various warnings in this book to keep yoga secret. And I will explain why in a very practical way. You don't want to empower evil, do you? Yoga does lead to empowerment. If there is no moral foundation, it can lead to evil. That is why there are these warnings. We will come to that next week. We'll see. It's very interesting. Many of the dogmas and, and, and uh, uh, mystery that surrounds yoga all, will all disappear because everything has a practical explanation. Okay, let's have a short break.